everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Suresh Srinivasan. I'm the coordinator of the Beginners Special Interest Group of the Minnesota Astronomical Sorry. Society. So with that, I'm going to introduce Bob King. Bob is my buddy. He uh, is one of the best observers that I know. I, I tell him that often or often enough. Uh, he writes for Sky and Telescope Magazine. He has uh, his own blog called Astro Bob which is really good. Uh, Bob, I'll ask you uh, to send a link or tell people to link it how to join that. I think that'll be a cool thing. I'm a, I, I'm joined that and I read that every day. Um, so Bob's going to, today Bob's going to talk about Northern Lights. Uh, that's a big topic. Uh, we frequently, I see that come up on, on Facebook and places like that where people are like, when's the next Aurora coming? Or, you know, how, where should I go to see it? Or how can I see it? And I asked Bob to, to present on this because he uh, does a really good job with this stuff. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob King. Thank you, Suresh. I really appreciate that. Um, I love the Northern Lights, and I really, I really appreciate that's that all of you are taking out a piece of your day, one of the most spectacular days. In fact, it is the last day of winter in Minnesota, and a beautiful one too. So hopefully, I'll add a little extra beauty to your day by showing you some pictures of the northern lights. We'll go straight to the presentation. And as Suresh mentioned, feel free to ask in the chat box. Hopefully you should be able to see my screen now. Yep, it just popped up. See some slightly wavering northern lights. I've lived in Duluth many, many years. It's been over 40 years and I've seen I've never counted them, but I've seen at least a couple hundred different displays. Most of them are minor, but occasionally there is that big display. And since we're heading upwards, increasing in activity on the sun, we're heading up in the solar cycle, as we'll learn. I think in the next couple of years, we're going to have the opportunity to see some really spectacular Northern Lights displays. Uh, of course, we are only the latest inhabitants of the planet We've been struck by the aurora. Uh, we don't know this for a fact, 100%, but some anthropologists believe that these scrawlings on a cave wall in Europe were created about 30,000 years ago by Cro-Magnon Man, and they represent, they call them macaronis, which they kind of look like a little macaroni and cheese dish right there but they call them macaronis and uh, they believe this could represent the earliest picture or a, a petroglyph of the Northern Lights, the seeing the Aurora Borealis, perhaps 30,000 years ago. The earliest written observations we have of the Aurora go back to the uh, Chinese as do so many other things because they recorded lots of phenomena in the sky. There were lots of court astrologers. Astrology was very important to running their kingdom. Uh, here's a more recent view of the Northern Lights. This is back before we understood what it was exactly. It's a, an engraving of uh, from the year 1570, and it shows candles in the clouds, which arguably, uh, that's what the aurora sometimes looks like. Although, of course, we know that candles are not responsible for the aurora. Uh, before we actually knew what caused the aurora, there were lots of explanations, including sunlight reflecting off of Arctic ice, um, Inuit people playing a game of uh, kickball with a walrus skull, uh, the march of the dead across the sky to the other world. So there were wonderful graphic and cultural explanations for the Northern Lights. But as we move closer to the scientific era and our own era, of course, we've, we've really researched this now. We have a handle on what actually creates them. And even though I wish it were candles, it is something else. The Aurora Borealis, the word itself, that description comes from our buddy Galileo, who, has, who did a lot for astronomy, uh, discovering the moons of Jupiter, craters on the moon, the phases of Venus, you name it, that guy was there with his telescope. He... Uh, named the, named the uh, glow in the northern sky Aurora Borealis after Aurora, which is the goddess of dawn, and Borealis, which means north. So it resembles dawn, if you think about especially early northern lights before they get cooking with all the rays, and it's in the northern sky. So the name is perfectly apt, and it goes back to Galileo, who did name it in 1619. 
Coming into the current era, back in 1902-1903, the Norwegian physicist Christian Berkeland was the first to determine that the Northern Lights were an electrical phenomena related to material coming from the sun. And he would go around and do these amazing demonstrations with this globe you see in the center called a Torella. And he would have electric currents around it and it would glow and he would try to simulate the Northern Lights. And he was really the first one. He devoted so much of his life to tracking down what really caused the Aurora Borealis. 30,000 years after those cave etchings, here we are in orbit, 250 miles high. This is a view of the Northern Lights from the International Space Station. It, I mean, it's magnificent enough from the ground, but can you imagine being on board the space station, looking out the window? Well, here you can, you can see some cities down below and over these cities, some 60 to 75 miles high is a spectacular view of the Northern Lights. And here you are looking down on the Aurora. All of the Aurora, whether we're talking Northern Lights or Southern Lights, which is called the, uh, pardon me, Aurora Australis, uh, they all come from the sun, as Birkeland was correct in pointing out. That is the ultimate source. I was out skiing today and I saw that beautiful star and I thought, God, what a wonderful thing to be on a planet orbiting a star so closely that we can feel its heat. Uh, the sun is important to us by day, of course, but it's equally important at night, especially if you're a northern lights watcher, right? Because it, can fail away to create the Northern Lights. The sun is a star and it's, I like to call it a red hot ball of plasma. The temperature on the surface is 10,000 degrees deep down in the core of the sun where nuclear fusion takes place. The temperature is like 30 million degrees. That is hot enough and the pressure is intense enough within the core to actually fuse hydrogen atoms to create helium. And in the fusion process, energy is released and that energy wriggles its way out in all directions from the core until it arrives on the surface of the sun and then it leaves and it heats the earth. The sun, notice that I call it a red hot ball of plasma. What the heck is plasma? You might be surprised to learn that the most common form of matter in the entire universe is plasma. Stars are made out of this thing called plasma. And what it is, it's sort of like a really hot, hot gas. These are the different basic states of matter. We're familiar with them here. Solid, ice, right? Uh, if you heat ice, as I showed out here, you add heat as you're moving from left to right, it becomes a liquid. The molecules are broken apart, they are close to each other, but there's a little more disorder here. As you increase the heat, it becomes a gas where they fly apart from one another. And if you keep increasing the heat, the individual atoms that form those molecules, the electrons split off the protons in the atoms. So instead of a neutral atom where electron balances the proton, minus balances the plus, it becomes split. So you have positive protons and negative electrons. Um, this is called plasma. And it is so common because so much of the universe, the matter in the universe is in stars, which are hot, hot enough to take materials and turn them into plasma, this crazy mix of electrons and protons. Here's kind of a demonstration or a diagram where you can see high temperatures split the hydrogen atoms into electrons and protons. There they are wildly moving on the right-hand side of your screen. That's sort of really what the sun looks like if you could get right up close. It's a crazy mix of those two different subatomic particles. You don't have to go to the sun though to find plasma. Uh, the next time you're in a bar, uh, take a look at one of the bar signs and any of those neon signs that's also a form of plasma where an electric current is sent through a gas inside a glass tube and the current breaks apart the neutral atoms into 
electrons and protons. And when they recombine with each other, they give off light and they glow and create the neon signs that we're familiar with and that we enjoy. Uh, if you've ever bought one of those plasma balls or seen one of those plasma balls, that's also plasma. So we do have some familiar, and there are many more, but these are a couple of examples of it right here on Earth. Well, guess what happens when you liberate electrons from atoms? They race about and they create an electric field, right? Uh, when you plug in an appliance, for instance, you start the electrons rolling and those electrons do work. They have energy and they can run the appliance. They can get your snowblower going, whatever it is. Electrons are involved in any kind of electrical current. And when electrons move, and this is a whole gang of them here, when they move, they also generate a magnetic field. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. Take a look at this. This is just a double A battery, all right? And there's a wire on one end. When the circuit is completed, the electricity flowing through that wire from the battery will turn that compass needle. This is a really fun experiment to try to, uh, that will demonstrate electricity and magnetism and how close they are, how related they are as forces. Maybe you've seen one of these. I remember one of these as a kid. This is called a bicycle dynamo. This is an old fashioned one, probably not as efficient as the modern dynamos that bicyclists use. But you can also take and spin magnets around. And when you spin magnets, they will create an electrical current. So electrons flowing or magnets spinning can create electricity and magnetic fields. Why am I talking so much about magnetic fields? Well, ultimately, the aurora is a magnetic disturbance. It, it, it derives from the sun and the sun's electrical and magnetic currents. As the sun spins, and yes, it does, we can't see it spin, except we can look through a telescope and we can see the sunspots on its surface slowly march around the sun as the sun turns. And it takes about four weeks for that to happen for one spin. As the sun spins, that boiling, swirling plasma creates a magnetic field around the entire sun, essentially turning the sun into a gigantic bar magnet. When you walk out after our talk today and look at the sun, think of it as a huge bar magnet with the top, the North Pole, and the bottom, the South Pole. Very similar to a regular magnet, right? This is a classic uh, bar magnet. And on one end is south, the other end is the North Pole. And you can see that around that magnet, invisible to your eye, is something called a magnetic field uh, that stores energy. It's a, it's a type of force. And you can reveal that field if you take iron filings and sprinkle it around the magnet. And they will align themselves in the shape of the magnetic field. The sun, its magnetic field, also channels the particles, all those electrons and protons into beautiful feathers of light called its corona. The sun's corona is basically its outer atmosphere. And if you've ever gone to see a total eclipse of the sun, maybe some of you traveled out west to Wyoming or Nebraska back in August of 2017 and looked at the total eclipse of the sun, when the sun is covered by the moon, its corona is revealed. And look at this, doesn't that remind you, not just remind you, but it really is sort of a magnetic field in action, on display, channeling the sun's particles very much in the same way that that iron uh, bar magnet revealed its magnetic field with the phylings. So this is what we go to see when we see a total solar eclipse. We see the sun's corona, which is governed by its magnetic field. Now there's also other magnetism involved with the sun. It's a very magnetic star, you could say. Uh, the overall magnetic field, that big bar magnet I showed you is very weak, but the sun's magnetic field is also concentrated very strongly in sunspots. And here you can see a animation of the sun. So you can see it rotating in this picture. Magnetic fields are much, much stronger inside those sunspots. So in other words, there's a lot more energy 
concentrated within those dark regions. Just to give you an idea of the size of sunspots, it's pretty amazing. The sun itself is like, you know, like 800, 900 million miles in diameter. Oh, a thousand, pardon me, 800, 900,000 miles in diameter, excuse me. Uh, but sunspots, a good sized sunspot is easily larger than the planet Earth. And some are as big as Jupiter, as you can see here. And just like a magnet, once again, sunspots have north and south poles. They come in groups typically. Sometimes you'll just see a one sunspot on the sun. It won't have a companion. But more often, they have companions, which are called sunspot groups. And one part of that group, in this case, the leader spot, the one that's ahead of the follower, is the north pole of the magnet. And we can measure and determine its strength and say that's north. And then the other spot has a different polarity. It's the south pole. So when you see these sunspot groups, and you can see them with a small telescope equipped with a solar filter, a proper solar filter, you're actually seeing the magnetism of the sun manifested in just like a magnet with a north and south pole. The number of sunspots changes over time. The sun goes through a cycle. The basic cycle lasts about 11 years, where it goes from, here I've got the cycles. Notice I've started out here in the year 1900. Each cycle has a number. This is cycle 14, cycle 15, and so forth. And this one goes all the way through to 2010 or so. The number of sunspots is shown here on the left. And these are the peaks, and the peaks are about 11 years apart. So the basic sunspot cycle lasts 11 years. So it goes from a minimum where you see virtually no sunspots, as you see in this image on the right. I mean, the sun can actually be completely blank, sometimes for weeks, to a very spotty sun. And the sunspots themselves are always changing because the sun's surface, even though it looks steady to our eye, is churning constantly. These sunspots can grow, they can shrink, uh, disappear entirely. They can go through another rotation, three rotations, and still be visible before they disappear. So I have an image here from 2001, that solar maximum. The next solar maximum is predicted to occur in July of 2025. And that's when we'll see the peak number of sunspots, when the sun is most active. And that coincides typically with when the chances for the northern lights are at their highest. So as we ramp up from the previous solar minimum towards solar maximum, we're going to see increasing amounts and strengths of northern lights in the next couple of years, which makes me really excited. Now, the Bob, sun... Bob, let me do a quick check. Yeah, right? go ahead. Does anybody have any questions on what Bob has discussed so far? I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. I see three on... Oh, maybe that was from previous. Yeah. Anybody have any anything to add? Any questions? Okay. Back to you, Bob. All right. Great. Thanks, Suresh. Um, yeah, interrupt anytime. Uh, the, on the sun, or I showed you how the groups are kind of like magnets where one half is south, one half is north. But the sun's really, you know, being a star, it's kind of messy. It, it, it's, it's not as simple as this, bar, as this uh, horseshoe magnet, you know, with the uh, north and a south pole. On the sun, you'll sometimes get sunspot groups that have multiple north and south poles right next to each other. Okay, look at this picture. Look what's going on here. I mean, here's a standard north-south magnet, but these guys are really clustered close, multiple norths and souths. And that's when things can really get interesting on the sun. Remember I mentioned that the sun is not a static surface. It is like a pot of furiously boiling water. That heat that's generated in the core of the sun works its way up and forms these enormous bubbles that rise to the surface and give off heat. It churns the suns and bubbles the sun's surface to a great extent. Now on that surface, you've got the sunspots. 
And when you have those north and south poles so close together, and the sun's surface is churning, as you see here, this is an actual photograph of the sun, an animation of many images. These convective cells, by the way, are called granules. And each one of those is the size of Texas. So you have hot material coming off from the sun, that's the white part, and then it sinks back down and that forms the dark edges. Well, all of this churning is happening in and around the sunspots. And when you get that cluster of norths and souths together, those magnetic fields can twist, touch, and snap and release tremendous amounts of energy. It's almost like, uh, like two magnets, the north and south poles coming together. And I've got two magnets here and they make a really great sound just to give you an idea of the energy released. If you hear that, and I'll never get them apart. <laughs> you know how those rare earth magnets are. But when north and south come together, a tremendous amount of energy is liberated. The fields snap and they expel uh, gases from the sun in what's called a solar flare. And this is a photograph taken by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's an orbiting solar observatory around our planet. And, and always is photographing the sun. And here you have a flare in a sunspot group. A tremendous amount of energy is now being blasted out into space after the churning surface of the sun has brought those poles together, has connected them and released all of their power. Something like this. I was trying to find a good illustration <laughs> for, for, for how much magnetic energy is involved, but, but don't do this. You can get into trouble with really big magnets like the sun has. What happens though is during that explosion, a, a bundle of the sun's material, the very sun itself, some of that plasma is shot out into space and we call it a CME or a coronal mass ejection. This is a great sequence of it. Here in the center is the sun. It, we can't see it because it's being covered by a disc. Otherwise it would just be all glare, wouldn't it? but the explosion has now shot out into space, a whole cloud of the sun's plasma, this magnetized, electrified material. Here's an actual image, just a single image, showing one of these CMEs or coronal mass ejections. Uh, they can be many times the size of the earth. It's thin soupy stuff, but it weighs many millions of tons and it gets spread out through space. Uh, here we see the earth in the picture, that powerful, what we call the solar wind or a solar blast is now headed out into the solar system, right? And as it approaches our planet, luckily we have some defenses against this. The earth itself generates its own magnetic field. And it does that in a most interesting way. Deep beneath the surface, just outside the outer core of the planet, is a semi-molten, kind of a liquid iron core. And as that iron liquid moves, it's sort of like the uh, dynamo on the bicycle. The moving currents of iron create a magnetic field. There's an electric field, a magnetic field. Uh, the Earth's spinning helps to create this big, invisible magnetic field around us that serves as sort of a defense against what the sun might be putting our way. And most of the time, when that blast of wind comes from the sun, it just passes right by the magnetic field. Uh, it can push against it sometimes, but often it just slides by like water off a duck's back, basically, and we're none the worse for it. Here's uh, photographs that are made showing how the material from the sun spreads out. The sun is spinning, as I mentioned, so you, you can see the spiraling of material around it in these images. But this is a CME, and here's the Earth, so you can see in this CME it's predicted to pass by the Earth just like that. We have spacecraft out there. Well, first we have observatories that can see these blasts. Then we also have spacecraft that are out there between us and the sun that can detect these blasts at least a short time before they arrive on the earth. Sometimes the material from the sun 
does connect to our magnetic field. As I said, most of the time it just blows by. But if the direction of that material coming from the sun, it has a magnetic field in it too. There's a north part of the cloud. There's a south part of the cloud of particles. If the south part of that cloud happens to be hitting our magnetic field at just the right time, it will connect right there to our field. And that connection will feed the material. Here's the solar material coming on the left. That connection will feed those particles down along Earth's magnetic field, right down into the polar regions to create the northern lights. We first get a daytime northern lights, which you can't see. But then those lines, those connected lines, Earth and Sun, sweep back behind the planet and they reconnect here. This is the dark side of the Earth. You see this? This is the side not facing the Sun. So when these things reconnect on the dark side of the planet, the night side, that material then goes screaming in following Earth's magnetic field lines right into the upper atmosphere. And that connection between the sun and the Earth uh, powers those particles that it just sends them at such a high speed. 40, what do I have here? 45 million miles an hour they're traveling. And when they strike the molecules of oxygen, nitrogen, which are the, the most common gases in our atmosphere, they, caught, they excite them. And as the molecules calm down, they give off light. And it's that light from these trillions of minute atoms that are struck by mostly electrons, as it turns out, in the plasma from the sun, that are the essence of the Northern Lights. This grand display that we see really comes down to the very tiniest things in the whole world, subatomic particles. But we know how nature can do so much with the tiniest things if it has a lot of whatever it is. A drop of water that keeps on dropping for a thousand years can slice right through many feet of rock. Well, I mentioned that it comes down along Earth's magnetic field lines and those field lines come down to the surface in ovals on either end of the planet. And these are called auroral ovals. And when that material strikes the atoms, again, they glow. And these ovals are centered not over the geographic poles, but they're centered over the magnetic poles of the Earth. Here's an idea. Here, this gives you a little bit better idea. Uh, this is our geomagnetic pole. Uh, that is the center of where the material is coming down. And the material strikes the atmosphere in this ring. This is the auroral oval. And I've added a few towns. You can kind of see uh, who's the oval and who isn't. If you live in Fairbanks or Hudson Bay, or you're in Iceland or Norway, Sweden, or Siberia, this oval feature is permanent. It is there all the time because there's always some material working its way down into the atmosphere. So anybody who lives in that oval or if you travel to that oval, your chances of seeing the Northern Lights on any particular night are very high, like almost 100%. For us to see the oval in Minnesota, it has to expand southward. I've included Duluth here. So you can see how far off we are from the oval and Minneapolis isn't far away from Duluth. And that oval will expand when there's a particularly strong flare on the sun and it sends a lot of particles and the linkage between the sun's magnetic field and ours is strong. Then the oval grows and as it grows, it moves south. And finally from Duluth, and then Minneapolis, and then even Iowa. You can look north and you can see the oval coming your way, the edge of the oval. By the way, the, you'll often see the northern lights as an arc low in the northern sky. It looks like an arc because you're seeing the curved edge of the oval. You're seeing the edge of a much larger circle. This is the oval during quiet conditions, no storms. 
uh, like tonight, uh, if you could get yourself up to Hudson Bay, say in this area, go to Churchill tonight in Hudson Bay, you'd probably see the northern lights at least a little bit uh, along the northern sky. But during a storm, the oval just goes nuts, you know, it can expand. It's like a big donut or a bagel that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Sometimes that oval can expand so far south that people in Florida and even Cuba can witness a northern lights display. Hey, Bob. There's another view of it. Yeah. Uh, Steve Swanson asked a question. Are there southern lights? Uh, this oh, my gosh. The, his timing so couldn't have been better. Great. Uh, indeed, there are southern lights. This just shows kind of an animation of the changing oval as the storm progresses. And hold on, that should end. Yes, there are southern lights. Uh, and I have a picture of the southern oval that I'll show you in just a moment. And even a picture of the southern lights too. So uh, Steve, just hang on and we'll, we'll get there. Yes, because uh, the earth has a north and south pole. And just like that bar magnet, the material streams in here on top on the north and also down under. So yes, there are Southern lights simultaneously with Northern lights. They happen, they may not be exactly alike, but uh, they do happen simultaneously. So if you see a really great display in Minnesota, good chances are that people in New Zealand are also watching the Northern or the Southern lights, the Aurora Australis. Here is a satellite picture showing just a part of the oval. And this was during a storm. I'm sorry I don't have the date. But during the storm, you can clearly see that the oval is over northern Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana. On that night, and oh, anyone here in Minnesota, Twin Cities, even down to Milwaukee would have seen the northern lights. The northern lights, the oval, that bit of the oval, does not have to actually sit on top of you to see the northern lights. This phenomenon is 75 miles up. Being so high, you could see it from very far away. When you see an arc on the northern horizon, that arc, the edge of that arc, which is the edge of the oval, as I'm showing with my cursor, the edge of that arc is about five to 600 miles from you. And only when it goes overhead is the edge of the oval actually right over your head. So you don't, have to doesn't have to be over your head to see northern lights just within say 500 miles of your location this is a much more recent aurora november 4th 2021 just amazing forms isn't it here's duluth there's minneapolis uh there's the bakken oil fields this was visible across most of minnesota that night and uh, to further answer the question about the southern lights this is the southern oval uh, down here, it's not easy to see, but this is the continent of Antarctica. And here is the expanding southern oval. I recently went down to Antarctica. I was here in the peninsula. And then we went up here to the Falkland Islands. Now, it was November, so it was permanent twilight at that time of year. But in the Falkland Islands, I asked someone there whether they'd ever seen the northern lights because it gets dark there. Uh, in the summertime. And she said, she'd look, she, she was 67 years old. She says, I've never seen them in my life and I've looked for them. So it just doesn't happen to be in the right relation to the oval as the United States is. So, and we have, let's see here. So here's a picture taken by a friend of mine in New Zealand. Uh, you remember the showed you the Aurora Oval on November 4th, he photographed the Southern Lights on that very same night that we had them here. That's a picture from New Zealand. Uh, I mentioned the height a little bit about the Aurora. They can range from several hundred miles high all the way down to about 60 miles high. And that's the typical zone uh, where all of that excitement happens where the atoms get bombarded. Uh, they relax and uh, they give off light. Kind of like this. This is a little more detailed view of what happens during that smash up with solar particles in our own atmosphere. The electrons hit the air molecules. 
molecules get excited. And as they calm down to their previous, the original relaxed, relaxed state, uh, they give off light. At high altitudes, oxygen is responsible for the red color of the aurora. So if you've ever gone out and seen green rays with red tops or photographed red tops, the top is literally higher than the green and that's some oxygen high up in the atmosphere. The most common color from the Northern Lights is green, which is caused by excited oxygen in the lower part of the atmosphere. Now, occasionally, right down at the very bottom edge of that green, you'll see a deep red color. That is during a very powerful storm. Nitrogen at low altitudes, just below oxygen, can be excited and turn uh, or give off red light. So primarily oxygen and nitrogen. Now I mentioned that solar storms were the drivers of Northern Lights displays, but not always. Matter of fact, during solar minimum, you could often have displays of Northern Lights, not frequently, not necessarily large displays, but there is a second prime, there's several reasons or several causes for the Northern Lights. But besides flares, there's also something called coronal holes. Remember the corona? There's the sun. Here's this beautiful corona. Material streams from the sun outward into space. And it usually is moving at a few hundred miles an hour. But sometimes extra powerful streams can blow harder. And that hard blowing stream of material can also link in to Earth's magnetic field. Those holes, we have holes that sometimes form in the corona. And this is a really big hole in the corona. You can't see these holes in regular telescopes. You have to use telescopes that can see in ultraviolet light or X-rays, and then they're very obvious. And they're called coronal holes. And a coronal hole is a place where the magnetic field of the sun doesn't buckle down the particles. It's like an opening where the wind is free to blow from the sun. And sometimes that wind can blow at a very high speed. And the higher speed the wind, the more energy it has, and the better chance it has to produce an aurora here on Earth. One of the coolest things about coronal holes is that the long lasting ones can cause repeat auroras month after month after month. And I actually witnessed this, and maybe some of you did too, back in 2019. Here's a coronal hole on August 29th. We had the aurora uh, from the coronal hole. It sparked it right here in Minnesota. A month later, 27, 28 days later, September 25th, the same hole rotated back and we had another Northern Lights display and it did it again in October. So we had three months in a row of Aurora thanks to this one coronal hole. So scientists, astronomers can look at these holes and if they see them return, they can incorporate that into their forecasts along with the flares that you know can't be predicted. We can generally say when we're gonna have powerful flares closer to solar maximum, but they're iffier. You can't just say one's going to happen. But with coronal holes, they're a little more predictable. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Uh, real quick, when a coronal hole like that pops up or comes around, I should say, how long does it take for that material to get to us to cause the aurora? Uh, it takes about a day and a half or so to get here. Uh, it depends upon the speed of the particles that stream out of the hole. But usually it's around a day and a half, two days to arrive. So they're traveling at about 30 or 40 million miles per day, those particles. Yeah, I think a fast, I've read that a million, let's see here, is a million miles an hour. I don't, I know that they can travel faster, slower, but generally for coronal holes, it's a day and a half or so for that to happen. And I'm going to point out, we're coming up to where how you can get a forecast for these sorts of things. So you can anticipate because the forecast will say we've had a coronal hole and we expect the aurora to happen on such and such a day. So a coronal aurora 
looks more like this. I mean, sometimes you can get a bigger storm, but yeah, we call it a minor storm. You'll see an arc low in the northern sky and feathered by several pillars and rays. This was just taken a couple miles north of my house. Uh, I've identified various northern locations, this places where I can get good views of the northern sky to see the northern lights and check them out. And we're going to talk about that too. Uh, some of the time, though, uh, for better or worse, the best place is just a road where you have an open view to the north. And since the aurora often happens late at night, uh, people aren't out driving around. So sometimes I'll just park off to the side of the road and do my aurora observing and photography that way. So we're gonna look at the different stages of the Northern Lights. All right, we're gonna assume this is a great night, uh, that it's gonna start slow, which it often does, but then blossom into something incredible. And you will see in the upper part of your screen something called the KP number, all right? With each phase of the northern lights, there is associated something called the KP index or number. It's just called the KP number. When we have a low arc in northern Minnesota from Duluth North, just a faint glow or low arc, that would be considered active conditions with a KP index of four. When that arc doubles and thickens and it gets brighter, then the KP index goes up to five. And instead of just being called an active situation, we're now into what's known as a minor storm. So if you are out uh, and you see just an arc to begin with, and you hang around for 20 minutes, a half an hour, and notice that the arc is getting thicker and brighter. Stay there. That's what I tell people. Just stay there because if there's if there's a sense of direction, if it's increasing, stick around because you're likely going to at least get to the stage where the arc breaks up into rays. And that's not only beautiful to look at, but lovely to photograph too. And I've got some photo tips at the end for you. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Yara asked a question. Do the northern or southern lights increase our exposure to the sun's harmful rays in the areas in which they happen? Um, we're protected by our magnetic field and the atmosphere. So those particles do not make it down to knock on your head or anything like that. Is that what you're asking about? That type of protection? Yeah. Yeah. She says yes. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're protected. Um, even if we were to lose our magnetic field briefly, the atmosphere would still provide excellent protection. Not the best, but uh, good protection against particles coming from the sun. It's a barrier to those particles. And the fact that you see the northern lights uh, demonstrates that all of those electrons and protons have been slowed down, have struck the atoms, and the atoms have absorbed that energy and it will not make it down to the surface, only with your eyes, but bodily you're protected. So as we proceed into our minor storm, you'll get the arc, you'll get some faint rays, and these numbers are good for Minneapolis area as well. KP5 would be a minor storm. If you find a dark sky, you look out north, you'll see a glow above the horizon. This is when things get exciting, and this is often when things get late. <laughs> There's nothing worse than going on Facebook and discovering that after you went to bed, the northern lights just took off. And that's happened to me a few times. But most of the time, I just stay up. I figure, well, this is starting to look good, so let's just hang around. When a storm is at KP6, the moderate level, you've got a lot more activity. You have rays, which are now stretching, kind of like taffy, up towards the top of the sky. Uh, you've got movement of the rays. You'll often see them rippling to the left or west or rippling back to the east. Cameras record more colors, not just green. You'll get some violets and some pinks as well. This is a moderate storm, but progressing. Now we've got the whole western and northern sky just towering with rays. This was an aurora here in Duluth a few years back. And during a seven or eight KP, we have a, a major storm. And that's when the oval uh, goes right over you and even beyond your location south. 
so that you can look up and see the spectacular feature in the sky called the Aurora Corona or Corona Aurora. And it's called a Corona because it, it looks like, you know, God is coming or something. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Uh, effect of rays radiating, appearing to radiate from one point in the sky. I want to tell you what you're really seeing. Imagine lying underneath a curtain, say in your living room, and you know how the edge of the curtain is curled like that at the bottom. What you are doing here when the aurora is at this face, it's directly over you, and you are looking up at those curtains so you're looking up at the this is the edge of the curtain and the curtain goes up 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 higher and higher and higher into the sky this is a three-dimensional thing remember so it's actually towering from lower to higher as if you're looking up curtains and those curtains all appear to converge into one point in the sky this is when you're if you get to see this aurora i promise you will not get to bed until after two o'clock in the morning hey bob Yep. Isn't it true to say what KPI is, say a KPI of six at our plus 45 north latitude? That's roughly about a 50% chance of seeing some activity. And then would... a KPI of eight would be like 80% for people that want to plan ahead, you know, if they see something like this. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah, I, I've never broken it into percentages uh, because if it's a KP5 in Duluth, there's a, about a 100% chance of seeing the northern lights. So, and that would be pretty close to the same in Minneapolis, if you could get north of the city to find a dark sky, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it's not directly related to percentages that way. If it's a KP of seven, let's say it like this, your chance of seeing the Northern Lights is 1000% <laughs> for our region. There's, if it's a KP of six, you will see 100% chance of Northern Lights. KP of five, pretty close to 100, KP four, you gotta find a dark place really dark place with a good horizon. So not directly related to percentages. So let's talk about these KP numbers since I've spent so much time talking about them already and you're wondering what is this, where's this stuff coming from? The KP data is gathered by a network of these devices called magnetometers. There are a whole bunch of them around the planet. And what they're doing is they're measuring magnetic fields and currents in the ionosphere up there 60, 70, 100 miles high where the aurora is. And when there's big disturbances, they feed that information to a central bureau in Colorado, to NOAA, and then that data is converted into a number. And that is the KP number. So we have a scale that helps us understand and rate uh, how far or how disturbed the upper atmosphere is. And the more disturbed it is, the better chance we have of seeing the Northern Lights. Each KP number is then associated with a particular type of storm. As I mentioned, there's the minor storm, right? Major and so forth. Well, what a KP of five for our region means a minor storm, also called a G1 storm. And you can see that each type of storm can have effects actually uh, in space around the planet or on the ground. Power grids might register fluctuations during a minor storm. During a moderate storm, or on your right here, KP6, we've got much more happening, right? Uh, potential satellite issues uh, fading out of shortwave radio during a strong KP7 storm. You may have some power station issues uh, or satellite problems. And then you can go up the scale here to eight. And the top of the scale is nine. And then at 10, we're all going to die. No, just kidding on that one. But at nine, uh, unless your power grid is well protected, and ours is, as I understand, and at least in the Duluth area, Minnesota power, uh, major issues could happen with those grids, as did happen back in 1989 in Quebec when a major storm occurred and the fluctuating electric and magnetic currents in the ionosphere actually caused transformers to overload here on the ground and damage their power system. People were without power across Quebec for like a day or something. So it can have strong effects on the earth, uh, especially with power grids, unless they're well protected. 
It can also affect the pipelines. Uh, they conduct electricity and uh, that will cause corrosion. So they are also uh, vulnerable. But you can see each KP number is associated with the storm. Minor, strong, extreme, and so on. So I'm gonna show you how you can get the forecast for what's coming up. You may wanna know, well, great. I wanna know what the chances are based upon observation of the sun, based upon what the satellites are sensing. What is, what is the best time to look? And this is called the geomagnetic forecast from the Space Weather Prediction Center at NOAA in Colorado. And you can have this delivered to your mailbox several times a day as I do. I've, I've received it for years, so I'm always throwing out lots of these. But I just do a quick look. If you go down to the bottom of your forecast, you're gonna see times and dates. It's always three days. In this case, it was August 31st, September 1st, and September 2nd. These are KP numbers. So on August 31st, 23221, nothing. You look at that and you're like, there's really, you know, I'm not going to see anything here. If you were in Hudson Bay and it was KP two or three, you would see Aurora. But it's got to go to at least four or five for Minnesota for us to actually say, well, I'm going to go out and take a peek. September 1st, though, notice five. And then on the second, the forecast was for six, which is a moderate storm. Remember, five is minor, six is moderate. I want to point out the times so that you're not confused when you get these forecasts. The times are UT or universal time, basically Greenwich, what time it is in London. So you've got to subtract, now that we're in daylight saving time, you got to subtract five hours. And when you subtract five hours, zero, which is midnight, becomes 7 p.m. So this is really August 30th from 7 p.m. until 10 p.m. I hope that makes sense. If you subtract five hours from here, you get what? Um, into the morning hours until 1 a.m. And then the KP is three. So just remember uh, to subtract those five hours and on the early times, it's going to take you back to the previous day. So this is from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. August 30th, because you're going back a day. I know it's a little confusing, but you look at it these in the hand. Today's forecast, I just uh, downloaded, and not much is happening. March 19th. Remember, this is really the 18th for these hours. Uh, tomorrow, I should say, let's see, March, today's the 19th, right? So on March 20th, it goes up to active. And March 20th is really March 19th from 7, 0 to 10 p.m. So there is a chance tonight for northern areas to see maybe a little glow on the horizon. So I'm going to go look this evening if, if it stays clear. Uh, it's still not a five, um, not a big deal. So you saw, well, I had it here, but I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna ask Suresh to send you all this uh, URL, this link, but right here is how you subscribe. And there's a bunch of different services. You can plug into not just this forecast, but they've got geomagnetic this, geomagnetic that. Just take a look at them. There's lots of different things you may want to subscribe to. And then it's just emailed to you. One of my favorite places though, when in doubt, and you wanna know, man, is it worthwhile to go out and look for the Northern Lights? Well, I'll update my blog on Facebook. You can go there, but I often will go to the Great Lakes Aurora Hunters page on Facebook and just see what's going on here. Because these, these people are just like out there with bated breath. They, at the merest sign of any Northern Lights, they're gonna report right here. So you can check here regularly if in your forecast, it looks like there's a possibility for Northern Lights. Great Lakes Aurora Hunters, I've got the link for you in a minute. There are also Aurora apps and unbelievably these things work. I used to think, nah, nah, this can't really work. But they do. Uh, I do get alerts. And when you get an alert, it will say KP index becoming high for your area. It'll ding. 
and it'll tell you that. And you can also look on these apps. You can look and it'll show you the Aurora Oval. So you can get a sense of the extent of the Aurora. Is it approaching Minneapolis? Is it approaching Duluth? Where are we at right now with that oval? So very helpful, not just visually, but also with that alert. Before we wrap up, um, I want to address just briefly the issue of light pollution, because we could talk about the northern lights all day and just think, great, I'm going to go see them. But we all know that light pollution is a major problem for most of us. Uh, in Duluth, my southern sky is fairly destroyed by the lights of the city because I'm north of Duluth. Fortunately, there are very few towns north of Duluth. So when I look to the northern sky, I can usually tell if there are northern lights. You may not be in such a fortunate situation because all of these lights, and the primary issue with bad lighting uh, is not that there's too much light sometimes, but that it's poorly shielded. Look at these lights. They are clear glass globes. And the light, some of it, a minor part, goes down on the street where you need it. But so much of it just goes up into the sky. And that destroys the sky for visual observing, telescope observing. But if you're a northern lights lover, uh, you're not going to see the northern lights under these conditions. You need to escape this light or work to reduce it, certainly. This is a picture taken a little north of Duluth. Uh, here's the constellation Orion. There's his belt. But you can see Duluth and Superior really have a nasty light dome towards the south, southwest. And you've got your own light domes to deal with. One way, one thing I can offer to help you is this light pollution map, which you can access online at light pollution info, or pardon me, light pollution map dot info. I've centered it on Minneapolis. Red and purple, not good. <laughs> Lots of light. Yellow, not so great either. But as you move into these blue regions, these are areas of relative darkness, especially if you're looking for northern lights to drive north of the Twin Cities area so that you have a decent northern horizon and also not so many large cities and suburbs in that direction. So you can go to this map and enlarge it and go right down to the smallest roads. And this can help you find a reasonably dark place for you to observe and photograph the northern lights. And that brings me uh, to, to, the, uh, to the end, basically. And that is about photography. This is my northern light setup right here. I use a tripod and a DSLR. Got a Canon and I use a wide angle lens. Actually, it's a zoom lens. It's a 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter. If there's a chance for lights, I'll go out and I see it. Or if I want to take a picture first because I suspect northern lights, but I can't verify it. Cameras are great at that, by the way. If you think you see something, but you aren't sure, take a picture. Um, I use, as I mentioned, a wide angle lens. You could use a straight 35 millimeter lens, very inexpensive purchase, or a zoom, a 16, 15 millimeters. You don't want to have a telephoto or anything like that. A 50 millimeter lens is okay, but wider is better because it tends to be a wide phenomenon. Here's the back of my camera. The main thing you want to do when photographing any type of sky phenomenon, including the northern lights, is to use what's called the live view button. You press that button and it gives you a live view through the camera. So as you look at the back screen and move the camera around, it's live like, like a video. You take that camera on the tripod and you point it at a bright star. Then you press the magnify live view button until that star is at 10x, 10 power. And then you manually focus your lens. You must put your lens in the manual mode. It can't do autofocus on stars. Just when you do any aurora photography, bottom line, everything's manual, nothing automatic. So lens on manual, manually focus using the live view. And then once you're happy with how sharp the star looks on your focus, set your time. 
If it's a dim aurora, I go straight to 30 seconds. I open my lens up all the way for my camera, that's 2.8. For yours, it might be 3.5, 4.5, but open it up to let in the maximum amount of light. And set your sensitivity to 1600, just for starters. If you've got a bright northern lights where it's just unbelievable, you are going to be backing off and going to 10 seconds for that exposure. The beauty of digital photography is that you can always check the back of the camera. And if it looks too faint, increase exposure time or up the sensitivity to 3200. But the key thing is manual and live view if you have a DSLR so that you can carefully focus on the stars. Otherwise you'll get big blobs and you want sharpness. And the faster the lens, in other words, the wider it opens up, the shorter the time you can use. So 30 seconds you can record the aurora. But if you could photograph the aurora in three seconds or four, it will preserve the sharpness of the forms you see with your naked eye. Uh, a longer exposure will blur those forms to a degree because the northern lights is moving, right? Those rays are pulsing and changing. So it's a little bit of a balance back and forth, playing with the ISO, the lens opening, but bottom line, manual, 30 seconds, wide open, 1600, go for it. You'll get something. Hey, Bob. <laughs> yeah. We have a few questions and comments. I'm a little yeah. behind on this. Uh, Bala asked, um, is the subtraction for UTC just central, just central standard time six instead of five? I think he means for standard time, right? Daylight. The daylight uh, is yeah, five is standard. For standard time, do six. Right, and that's yeah, what, exactly. November, Thank, November yeah, to yeah. March. Uh, November to March. Right? November, right, November to March, you got to do minus six on those. And, and you know, I, I bring it up, I, I have to point that out, but don't worry too much about the times. Some You could do a shorthand. That first day you see, remember it was August 31st? Just go, that's really the night of August 30th, okay? And then the, uh, the next night, September 1st, that's really the night of August 31st just subtract a day as and, a and, shorthand. And by and large, Northern Lights forecasts aren't to the hour. They're oh. to a couple hours at least, right? Yeah, and you saw they had them on three hour intervals. Uh, the thing about the Northern Lights is that it is primarily brightest and best around 11 o'clock to two in the morning, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Because that's when that oval swells in our direction. It has its offset over the United States during the midnight hour. It's offset to the south. So our best chances in the U.S. of seeing it, in the central U.S., are between around 11 o'clock and 2 a.m. That doesn't mean it can't happen outside of that range. And remember, that's only a prediction. It's like a weather prediction. And sometimes they're off by two hours. So you might go to bed, and then the whole thing blows up, you know, and you missed it. Or... It might be right on time. Uh, was there another question, Serge? Uh, Tina Gross, yeah, I'm getting, Tina Gross asks, do you have a favorite forecast app? Um, I've got those, yeah, I have those coming up, Tina. Okay, and then Bala added to that Aurora Alert. That's what he uses. Okay, uh, that's and, good, that's good. And then Tina was looking for it. She asked for the developer name because she, she found a, four apps called Aurora Alert. <laughs> Uh, they're so they're really bad. They're they all kind of are named the same. I uh, yeah. discovered, but uh, that's why I keep two of them on my phone. And I'll show you two in just a moment, Tina. The ones I use anyway. So once you've got your camera set, this is the best part. All right, all you got to do is just keep shooting. You got your exposure, and you stand. You are just there to enjoy the show. And every once in a while, you press the button when things are happening. You want to catch that moment. Every once in a while, and this is me, by the way, every once in a while, I'll change the lens setting. I'll make it a little wider. If I see a bright ray off to the left, I'll shift the camera so that ray or that bright arc is centered better. So you're composing a little bit, but it is quite relaxing and enjoyable because once you've got the exposure set, you can just shoot away. And cameras are quite different from the eye. And this is, I tried to make a demonstration to show you. There's the camera view on the left, right? 
very colorful. This is not fake. This is what the camera sees because it is super sensitive because you're doing time exposures. Our eyes can only see in the flash of a moment. We cannot collect the light like a camera. So colors, it has to be very bright for us to see colors. And some auroras really are bright enough where there's vivid green and intense red, but most auroras visually look like the right-hand side of the picture here, where you see a little bit of a green glow, and then the rays are basically white or gray. So it is different from what you're going to see on Facebook or wherever posted. But not that that detracts from it for me, because when you're out, you're seeing the real thing, and it's moving, and you're part of the experience. Nothing matches it. I would say auroras and eclipses are about equal, total eclipses, as far as the best astronomy has to offer. All right, here are the promised links. <laughs> we have, this is the one that I've used, Aurora Forecast. Okay. There's the Android link. There's the iPhone link. Here is an online view of the Aurora Oval. That light. There's the Space Weather Subscription Service, the Great Lakes Aurora Hunters on Facebook, and there's my blog. And I during Auroras, I post updates on Facebook. So if you want, I can send this to Suresh, and he can send it all to you, all to you, uh, and then, or you can just take a picture of your screen right now if you like. Yeah, I don't have everybody's email, so all I can do is post it to the uh, MAS uh, forum under uh, yeah. Sig. Well, I'd be happy to send all these links to you uh, to use them as you need it, but or just as I can uh, take a picture. And I don't have the second Aurora. I only put the one Aurora forecast. I've got another one. It's the Aurora alert too. And they're both free. These are, matter of fact, all these things are free. So I can also vouch for Aurora Pro. It's an app I've been using for a few years. Good. It's good. Now, the, whatever works for you, go with it. But whatever you do, get the one with the alert because you may not be paying attention to the forecast, but the alert, and sometimes the forecast is wrong and completely wrong. And so it's nice to have something live to remind you. Hey, Bob, Honey, I just be... wanna wrap up here with the, oh. No, I was go just ahead. gonna say, uh, I just wanna make one last plug for your uh, camera set. If you can go back to your camera slide real quick. Which I think is like four slides back maybe. Is this the one? No, the one where you're standing there with the camera. <laughs> oh, this one, yeah. One, one more back. There you go. So since Minnesota is so cold, uh, instead of standing there for hours uh, trying to take pictures, you might want to consider getting an intervalometer for your camera. Uh, some cameras have them built in. That way you can sit in your car nice and warm while your camera is just clicking away and taking your exposures. So you don't have to sit there and manually do it. Right, you could do that. Uh, that is, that's a good suggestion. I never do that just because I like photographing the moment that I see and I think looks great. And then I don't have so many pictures to go through. Well, there's that too. But maybe I'm, but I'm lazy. And then I, I'm so used to freezing my butt off anyway. But what you say is a great suggestion. So yeah. Because sometimes it's tough to be out at night. I mean, three quarters of the year, it's really cold here. So and yeah, you're, you, can, you can set up your camera and take a nap and come back in half hour, an hour, and get some pictures. Oh, I would never take a nap during a run. <laughs> that, that just wouldn't be physical. That just wouldn't be possible. But uh, each to his own. Uh, let me just finish with the what last foot. Was there anything else, Suresh, that you wanted no, to add? No, Nancy Rand asked a question. You had a sentence, yeah. the more disturbed uh, the upper, upper atmosphere is, and then dot, dot, dot. Can you say that again? Oh, yeah. The more, um, uh, when, when the sun's particles arrive, you know, it's like a swarm of bees up there, stinging molecules, stinging atoms, uh, and all of this flow of material coming in at millions of miles an hour creates all these fluctuations in electrical and magnetic currents, 75 miles, 100 miles over your head. And the magnetometers on the surface will pick up those fluctuations. In fact, if you had a sensitive compass and it was a big time Northern Lights, you would actually see the needle of the compass turning this way and that a little bit from north because of what was happening overhead. 
That's something I've always wanted to try, by the way, but I haven't, is to get a really good compass and watch the needle during the storm. Does that answer your question? Fancy, does that answer your question? I haven't seen her response. But there it is, yes. She says yes? Yes. <laughs> That's, all, that's the only question I hesitant. see. <laughs> but that's Go okay. ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, this is just my last slide, and I thought we would enjoy this because it was taken by the space station, like the one near the beginning of the presentation. But here you see our whole area, our region, uh, Minneapolis and Bismarck, Fargo and Duluth. And right there, north of Winnipeg, you can see the edge of the Aurora Oval. So it's just a cool picture that kind of puts the Aurora into the context uh, of where we live. That's a cool shot. Yeah. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. And we can uh, open it up to general uh, Again, I appreciate now. everybody taking, uh, yeah, Q&A or commentary would be fine, whatever you like. I, I'm yeah, here. whoever wants to jump in, feel free to speak or drop it in on the chat and I can read it. So Ron Schmidt uh, asks, so Bob, shortly after we met at Elcon in 2018, I know yeah. you retired from the Duluth News Tribune. How is retiring, retired life treating you? Have you oh. been off on any big observing adventures? Well, <laughs> retired life is good. <laughs> and yes, I was offered a couple of uh, big observing adventures. The first one was, uh, it, was a, it was an observing adventure to see the total eclipse of the sun back in December from the area of the South Georgia and Falkland Islands. And so as part of that, uh, we went down to Antarctica too. So we left. Uh, Chile, and we motored all the way down, just, I don't know, it was like 800 miles of Drake Passage, uh, and visited Antarctica, and I got to, I really, I got to camp out uh, in Antarctica for one night, and just see, just be there during that all-night twilight, I loved it, and then we went up to the Falklands, unfortunately, the eclipse was cloudy, uh, it was dark, we got to experience that emotionally, but we saw no sun. Uh, so yeah, there's that. And then I recently uh, uh, went with Suresh and a few friends to a wonderful place in Oklahoma where the sky was really dark. And that was a spectacular observing experience. Six so those couple of things. <laughs> What's up again? All right. Still Six recovering from staying up all night, <laughs> many nights in a row. But it is nice to have the flexibility to stay up late and not worry about the next morning. And when I worked, I remember suffering a lot at work you know, because I attended a lot of meetings and I would fall asleep during most of those. Thanks for asking. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Bob, Thank, I'll you. Ask a, Thank I'll you, ask a Ron. Thanks yeah. for that compliment, Ron. Such a quick question. I know that in Norse mythology, the sagas, aren't they uh, a lot of them tied in with the Northern Lights that they get? Like, some of their stories and stuff. Yeah, I'm sure they're, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with the Norse ones in particular, but uh, yeah, so many culture, Northern cultures have stories about the Northern Lights, uh, mythological tales. Because you can Lights. imagine back then, you know, before the, before light bulbs, they probably saw Northern Lights every night, you know, going out. Oh, from up, up North, yeah. Yeah, just in the like, winter time, it's night, all night, all yep. day. Yeah, it was just, it was part of their common life. And of course, there's the whole uh, debate over whether you can hear the Northern Lights. Some people do claim that they've heard them. Correctly. Scientifically, there's been very little. I've only heard one recording that was supposed to be of the sound of the Northern Lights. And it was uh, like a sharp crack. Crackling. And yep. not that I know, but that sounded to me like what happens on a winter night when it's really cold and sap freezes in trees and the tree pops. Yeah. And so I, I'm skeptical, but I think it might be possible for somehow for, a, you know, via electrical currents for that sound to possibly be heard or transmitted by someone. Uh, but I've, 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 I've poked an ear. I've turned my ear up as many times <laughs> And I've never, ever heard any sound. I've heard rustlings of winds and pops and cracks and things. But, so uh, I would recommend to everybody on this call that they subscribe to Bob's Astro Bob blog. 
Bob, how do, how do people do that? Uh, well, it's it, it just, just the thing is, it's you only get a few views a month, unfortunately, because it's through the News Tribune. Mm -hmm. And but you can go just type in Astro in space Bob Astro Bob, and that that will do it for you. And it'll take you right there to the blog to the most recent ones. And there was a question about yeah. uh, where would I? What was that? Where would I go? Where would you go? In Wisconsin, was it? Well, there's one here from Susie. It says, if you're going to plan a trip to see the Northern Lights, where and when would you go? Oh, I'd go to Fairbanks in uh, winter or spring. Because, Fairbanks, Alaska? Yeah, I'd go to, I mean, if you want to guarantee see the Northern Lights, go to Fairbanks. Uh, and there are, you can look up online, there are tours, Northern Light tours, places you can stay. Uh, and you will see the Northern Lights provided the weather cooperates. Some people like to go to Finland, Norway, Sweden too. There are tours to those places as well, but I think uh, Fairbanks might be more affordable. I know in, Nor in uh, Norway, they have those yurt. yurt uh, yeah, locations. yeah. You sleep in a yurt. yurt. Right. And look up at the Northern Lights. That's out there. Gonna, we're going to have to do that. Oh, in Iceland too. There's another, that's a great place too. <laughs> Bobby, um, where do you go locally? Uh, I know that you're up in Duluth, but I know I get this question a lot from MAS members, you know, right. where can I go to see them? Where do you go? Yeah, that's the, most, that's the most common. That's why I show the light pollution maps that you can at least, you know, if you're in the Twin Cities area, in the region, you can find a spot. Uh, where I go in Duluth, it's much easier than it is for the cities to escape that light. So I go to, a, I've got a couple of little spots. I go on that road, that picture you saw with the road, and that's about less than 10 minutes from home. Great view to the north. That has a pullout as well. So my favorite place is a pullout about 10, mile, 10 minutes from here. But if I really want a good spot, I drive 20 miles north of Duluth on a dirt road, park my car, uh, and I, it's got a great view of the northern horizon. What I'd recommend is that, thank you, Phil. I appreciate Hey, Phil, good to see you. Um, what I'd recommend for you, now I did not mention this earlier, is to go out in the daytime and scout out a place so that when, it's, when we have the northern lights, you get that forecast or, and you check Great Lakes Aurora Hunters, you know where to go. You know, you, you don't want to be searching at night for a place because you're going to drive off the road. A friend of mine did that. He was looking for the place and he was looking through his windshield with the Northern Lights and trying to drive and he drove into the ditch. So don't do that. I can tell you a popular place for MAS members is Crex Meadows. Which yeah. Is up, near, up near Grantsburg. Uh, it's oh, about, oh. from my house, I live in the West Metro. It's about 90 miles, I think from the the east side is a little bit closer, but they say it's really dark up there. Crex Meadow. Have you been up there? Has anyone in this listening now been up to Crex Meadows and can speak for that? It, it looks not. like a great out of the way area. I know, for example, Steve Baranski from our club goes there often and, is a, and Clayton has been up there several times. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's supposedly really dark and we have unlimited access. There's no, there's no amenities. There's no bathroom. There's none of Perfect. That, but it's like kind of a marshy area that's really dark. Because that sounds like the perfect place because no amenities means probably no lights. Nothing. No parking lot. Some mosquitoes apparently in the summer, but you know, that comes with yeah. the territory. So, but my honestly, my I would love to set up a field as an Aurora Observatory. If I had any sort of a dream, it would be to build an Aurora Observatory, a place where people could go and park and just look at the northern lights because the interest is so tremendous, so high. I think our issue here, Bob, is even with the KPIs of six, is the light pollution around here. You really got to have a major storm to see them from yeah. the city. Yeah, uh, you really do have to get out of the cities and to, to see them. So that I don't really get excited until it gets to at least six, if not higher, here. Yeah, I think that. I think for you, Suresh, you're right. You're dead on. I think it's got to hit six to be able to go out in the cities close to where you live to see it. Otherwise, you'll need to drive north. Right. Yep. Crex Meadows, K C R E X. Yeah. Does anybody has... else have any questions or comments for Bob? He's done such a great job here, as usual. Bob, uh, really appreciative. Thank you very much, Sir. It was fun. I hope uh, I appreciate it again on a wonderful day, people spending time. So thank you very much, everybody. All right, guys. If that's all we've got, I'll end it here. Thank you again. Let me just mention that the next BSIG event. 
Uh, we're going to go start going outside after this. Bob's uh, finishing up our presentations for the winter. So thank you again, Bob. Um, we probably will not do one in April because I don't think the field at Metcalf will be dry enough. So the next scheduled one will be on May 7th, which is Saturday. Uh, we're going to follow it up really quickly right after that with our second event on May 15th, which is a Sunday night. And the reason is because we had a total lunar eclipse. So we're going to have back-to-back -back, uh, weekends in May with, with BSIG events. So you can either watch for that on the MAS forum uh, for updates or uh, drop me a note um, and uh, I can keep you up to date that way as well. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm going, to, I'm going to end it here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Suresh. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.